becoming who I want can often feel lonely. And often I try to become what others want me to be. Sometimes I doubt myself. Sometimes I struggle. I don't always remember who I am. Becoming what others want around me can be so easy. But you gain so little. And yet, in my secret place, God meets me and is patient with me. God sees us. He us where we're at. Where we're going. I guess becoming who God created me to be will present as challenges. And I remember that I must push through. I don't have to do it alone. There's more for me to do. I am becoming everything I was meant to be. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Will you worship the Lord in prayer with me? God, we thank you for you alone are worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God, you are a phenomenal, gracious, merciful, amazing God. And once again, we are in awe of the fact that in spite of us, you continue to love us, sustain us, and strengthen us. We're grateful for another opportunity to come and to witness your power and your spirit. So as I stand, I pray that once again you allow the words that you have placed upon my heart, that I've meditated upon and prayed upon to once again escape into the hearts of your people, whether they're online or even in person. So Lord, we pray now that you are magnified in this moment. Lord, use me afresh. I studied, but I need you. Prayed, but I need you. And as we begin this series on this summer, I pray that someone is challenged and transformed to realize that they have the uh, wonderful opportunity of becoming. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We greet you with the joy of Jesus, and it is our prayer and our desire continually that God would grace each and every one of you to our tab, iFam, and to those of you who are sharing with us in person. What an awesome God we serve, and we are so in awe of who God is and what God continually does. Does. I invite you to turn with us to the book of Judges. We're beginning a series for the summer to constitute our time of sharing. I will admit to you it was not my first nor even my second <laughs> thing that I was planning to preach this summer, um, but the Lord really kind of directed me and arrested me to shift. And so for the duration of the summer, we're going to share a story that most people do not know, but I think is powerful and impactful. We're going to look at the story of Gideon. Gideon is one of the judges that we begin to see God use in a phenomenal way. The interesting notion about this book, and I hope that you would glean and grab the entirety of this summer, is that in Gideon's eyes, he was nothing. But God used a nothing to turn something for God's glory. And hopefully as we begin to look at that, I am want to encourage you because all of us can be Gideon. And God can use us in spite of us. As we begin our series today, I want us to read the first few verses here in Judges chapter 6. Give me a few moments to kind of lay down some foundation. This narrative has arrested me because there's some amazing stories about Gideon that I think you will find useful and challenging and transformative. I'm going to read these verses out of Judges chapter 6. and We'll begin at verse 1. Hear ye the word of God. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts, derived in droves of camels, too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Oprah, which belongs to Joash, the clan of Abizer. 
Gideon, son of Joash, with threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? And the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. But the Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. But the time that we have as we're sharing on this inaugural message in our Becoming series, I want to preach from this idea today. You've got what it takes. Lord, speak. Your people need to hear. The book of Judges, my brothers and sisters, is a very phenomenal and interesting read. It is nestled in the history of the children of Israel between their conquest of the promised land with Joshua to the inaugural inception of the monarchs that was given to them first with Saul, then with David. Judges gives us wonderful insight, but it does show us the predictable patterns for which the people of God who have been blessed by God continue to relegate God. If I was to sum up judges in one particular word, it would be disobedience. Because literally what we see throughout the annals, the chapters, the narrative of judges is we see people who have been tremendously blessed by God continuing to be disobedient. And whatever their disobedience would sometimes cause them to stray and wander away from God, God would then use enemies, calamities, in order to oppress the people, not to destroy them, but to redirect them back to him. That's why whenever one reads the narrative of Judges, it goes in a predictable pattern where God is faithful to the people, the people become disobedient, God has to do things to allow the people to feel what it's like without God. They turn from their ways, repent. God raises a deliverer, and this deliverer rescues the people, and this is what we see as a narrative cycle of the book of Judges. It is through this it's powerful because these various moments is how judges are introduced to us in Scripture. From the greats that we hear of Ehov and Ophnael, even of the great one of Deborah and Samson, judges, who are literal deliverers who God uses at particular moments and particular seasons in order to bring deliverance, victory, and a calming presence back to the people of God. But it's interesting, my brothers and sisters, as much as we applaud these judges, and even though we must acknowledge the disobedience of the people, is when we look at the judges in their individual states, we recognize that for each and every one of them, there were some challenges, but God still allowed them to be called to be used as liberators for the people. From Ehom, who was left-handed, from Afnel, who ultimately was the first judge we hear, from Deborah, who even during this time was a woman, but still brought tremendous victory to God, and Samson for all of his proclivities, God used flawed, imperfect people as judges and deliverers to bring victory for his people. That's what brings us to Judges chapter 6. It is here that the narrative begins of this judge by the name of Gideon. Gideon, my brothers and sisters, was the one of the scripture judges who literally, based upon his own recognition, was the weakest and least of his own clan. It's interesting to note that out of all the judges that one reads in the book of Judges from Ophnel and Ehub and Deborah and Samson, no one gets as much press as Gideon. Gideon has over 100 verses that is ascribed to his narrative and his story, and we get to see the full trajectory of the life that Gideon leads. And then we see his beginnings, we see his victories, and we will also see his troubles. It is one of the few judges that we get insight to how even his faith begins to be challenged by his walk with God. That, in essence, is really what I want to suggest today. If we were to bring it into fruition, if we were to bring it close to ourselves, the reason why I would submit to you why Gideon is a story that is applicable for you and I is that it shows us how God can use any of us 
for his glory. Gideon doesn't have a great resume. Gideon is not of the best, but somehow, some way, with God's partnership, with God's presence, Gideon becomes one of the greatest deliverers for the people of Israel. And I want to raise that for us today. Because Gideon's call narrative, the verses that was read for us today, raises for us the reality that oftentimes the things that we think God is absent in is what God is calling us to be the answer to. Let me say that again. The things that we feel God is absent in is of everything that God is calling us to be the answer to. It reminds me of an interview by that famed writer by the name of Octavia Butler there in 2000 of Essence where she was challenged by a student who was wondering with all the problems that she had foresight, forecasted would come upon the people with all these things happening, where then is the solution? And to which Octavia Butler responded, she said, listen, there's a myriad of problems, but there are thousands of solutions, but here is the truth. You got to figure out where you fit in in order to be the solution to the problem. I believe that's what really begins to weigh for us here. Because as we began to look at this inaugural interaction with, with Gideon, before we even are introduced to Gideon, we see a lot of the challenges that are happening in this moment. I need to make sure that you're clear about it because here in this time, we see the major enemy, the problem facing the people. And when you read the first seven verses here in Judges chapter 6, we see what the problem is that's plaguing the people. They are once again being raided by the tribe called the Midianites. It's important to get this because this will be the central protagonist, the central uh, um, issue that they will be facing. The Midianites, my brothers and sisters, who were literally long-distant cousins of the children of Israel. They had come from the legacy and loins of Abraham. But at this junction in the history of Israel, the Midianites, watch this, were raiding the people. Things got so bad. Matter of fact, the scripture reminds us in these first seven verses that when we began to look at it here, it tells us that the Midianites were cruel in how they interacted with the Israelites. They didn't come to conquer them. They came to raid them. What they would do is that they would basically wait until the children of Israel had planted their crops. And now their crops had come to fruition. Harvest was now there. And then that's when the Midianites would show up. And the very thing that the Israelites had sweated for, the very things that they had invested in, is the very thing that the Midianites took away. I raise that for you and I today because I would offer that oftentimes that is perhaps the most damning and damaging issues that we face. I mean, it would be one thing if we were conquered by the enemy. But what happens when the main intent of the enemy is not to conquer you, but to raid you, to pillage you for the very things that you invested in? I believe I'm talking to some people that felt the pain and peril of the children of Israel. What are some things in your life that you worked hard for that the enemy keeps taking away? I'm talking to someone here that it might not be your livestock and it might not be your agriculture. It could be your joy that the enemy keeps taking away. It could be uh, the peace of mind uh, that you worked hard to have. I'm here to tell you uh, that one thing for them to conquer you, but another thing for them to raid you. Uh, and the text tells us the Midianites were so oppressive, they raided, watch this, not one, not two, but seven years. Uh, they had partners from Amalek and also from the east side, uh, and they forced the children of Israel uh, to run and hide in caves uh, in the mountains for seven long years. Whenever they tried to prosper, the Midianites Midianites would come in. As soon as they had a harvest, the Midianites would take it. This was the problem that were pegging the children of Israel for seven long years until finally someone had the bright idea. Let's call on the Lord for some help. And I just want to park here parenthetically. I want to suggest for you today, my brothers and sisters, I would tell you, I do wonder what took them so long. Why would they wait seven long years before they got the bright idea that maybe we need to get some help from the Lord? And I can already tell some of you are pointing your bony finger at the children of Israel. How dare you be so stubborn? How dare you be so arrogant? But let me ask you a critical question today. Since you're so critical of the Israelites, what's taking you so? long? How, how come you continue to allow yourself to keep being raided over and over and over again? And I know we don't like to act like it in service, and I know some of you watching online, you want people to act like you got it together. You so saved, so spiritual, that you ain't got no problems, but all the while, the enemy keeps pillaging, keeps raiding and taking from you. But at some point, child of God, I want to suggest to you that Midianites were never sent to destroy you or debilitate you. Sometimes the Midianites 
to send uh, to make you realize you can't do it uh, by yourself. Who am I preaching to today uh, that says, listen, I've learned a long time ago, uh, when problems come, get on your knees. Uh, when issues arise, get on your knees. Uh, when problems on every hand seem to come up, uh, you got somebody uh, that will come right to your rescue. Somebody can testify that you've learned that, that when grandma and them used to sing the song back in the day, it didn't mean much to you. But when you had your own problems, you learned the power in the words, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. It was after seven years that they decided to call on God. The text tells us that once they called on God, God sent a prophet between uh, verses 7 and 10 to remind the people uh, of his goodness to the people. He sends uh, an unknown prophet to the people to say, don't you remember I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt? Don't you know I'm the God that brought you through the Red Sea? Don't you know I'm the God uh, that has been making a way for you? And my critical question uh, in all of your pandering and all of your pillaging, uh, what made you forget how good I've been? It raises a couple of thoughts for us today. These uh, first couple of uh, verses of Judges chapter 6 raises two questions that I really want to make sure that you're clear about. Th these questions, these uh, interrogatives, if you will, uh, are things that I hope will kind of lend into the trajectory of what I'm hoping this becoming series will be. Number one question uh, that these verses raise for us today is you got to make sure that you don't allow trouble to make you think God is not on your side. I know there is a false uh, thinking. There is a fallacy of ideas out there where people assume that because you go through something, God is not there. This text is clear that sometimes uh, trouble is there because God has allowed it. But then the second question I want to raise, which moves us into the second portion of this narrative, is you got to be sure that God is not just sending help to you or for you, but you got to also make sure that perhaps God is sending help through you. Because that's when the passage shifts. And as these first 10 verses sets the outline for what was happening in Israel, the text then tells us that he decides to call a man by the name of Gideon. These verses from verse 11 through 16 outlines for us the call of Gideon. And I want to look at them because I want to suggest that these few verses, this narrative of calling of Gideon ought to remind us that God uses the unlikeliest of candidates to do the most improbable things to bring about certain victory for the glory of God. That this calling of Gideon, this man who will be introduced to in a more thoroughness in a few moments, begins to teach us that God once again commissions and calls uh, the most unlikeliest of candidates to do the most improbable things uh, to bring about certain victory for the glory of God. And all I simply want to tell you today, what this call narrative ought to encourage you and I, here's your take home truth, is simply this, God can use even you. Oh, I need you to catch that again. Let me try it again. Here is your life principle. God can use even you. Now, I know some of you, especially in person, uh, think I'm just pointing around you uh, or pointing over you. No, I'm pointing at you. I need each of you uh, to know that my main intent in this message and this series this summer uh, is not that God can use your neighbor, not that God can use the other qualified person on your job. God uh, cannot just use those people on the stage uh, that you feel is super duper gifted. What if I told you uh, that God has an assignment, God has a work even you need to do? And and part of our challenge today is learning how to embrace the uniqueness of the uniqueness God made you to be. And I want you to know that I know you got limitations, but you, God can still use you. I know you want to give God every excuse, but you got what it takes to be everything God needs you to be. That's really the whole idea of this passage. Let me share with you some introductory thought. There's a few movements of this text because I think this calling of Gideon challenges us because you and I find ourselves in the place of Gideon. So what are you saying, Pastor? Well, let me share with you how this call, how God calls Gideon. And I believe that this unique call narrative ought to simulate and be parallel with how God calls you and I even now. Here's the first thing I want you to jot down. When we think about this call of Gideon, and that you and I have what it takes. Number one, we see that God calls people, watch this, during seasons of obscurity. God calls people during seasons of obscurity. What, what do you mean? Well, when we're introduced to Gideon in verses 11 through 13, it's important to know that while the prophet has been sent as a reminder to the people, 
God already had an answer that he was going to do to the problem they were facing. They needed someone to help them with their problem of the Midianites. So what does God do? God sends an angel to sit under a tree, the great tree of Oprah, owned by the land of Joash. It's interesting, my brothers and sisters, if I had a little more time to explain this, I would suggest to you that it's unique how God shows up in this place. Because when one studies this place, this literally is the front line space between the Israelites and the Midianites. The space where the angel takes up residence in this moment is the very place that would be the first place that the Midianites would come to cross and to pillage and raid the people of Israel. So the angel of God is sent on the front lines. He's sitting under a tree. The text tells us sitting under the tree in close proximity to the man's son whose land he's on. Joash owns the land, but his son is the one for whom the angel has come to see. And the text tells us that he comes to see Gideon, and Gideon at this time is threshing grain on the wine press. Now, I hear what you're saying. Pastor, you're going to have to make this clear to me because <laughs> I need to understand why is that significant. I mean, why should I focus in on the fact that Gideon at this moment is threshing grain in a wine press? Well, the reason I think you should understand why this is important is because typically and better suited for threshing grain is done on a threshing floor. Threshing floors, my brothers and sisters, were typically in spaces that were high and prominent. They were typically in spaces of a large space. They were typically out in the public. Why? Because one of the key factors that helps you to thresh wheat effectively was wind. You needed wind so that when you threw the grain up, it, the wind would help you separate the wheat from the shaft. Typically, threshing floors were on mountain tops. They were in open spaces. But Gideon, in our text, is not threshing wheat on a threshing floor. He's in a wine press. Wine presses, typically where they would take the grapes to crush the grapes in order to move grapes to being wine. However, wine presses were not in open public spaces. They were typically in obscure spaces. They were not in high places. Typically, they would be in low places. You didn't need a lot of space for wine presses, but that's where Gideon was threshing his grain. He was not in high, prominent places where everybody could see him. He was in a secluded, obscure place uh, trying to go about the business of uh, threshing his grain. He, he was doing that according to what the text tells us because uh, he was hiding what he was doing because uh, if the Midianites had seen him threshing his grain, uh, then they would have came to try to pillage him uh, and take from him the very thing uh, that he was working on. So uh, what I appreciate about Gideon is that he understood Understood that I can't stop working so uh, let me find an obscure insignificant place uh, to do the work I'm called to do so yes it's harder in the wine press and yes nobody knows me in the wine press and no no one can see me however uh, he kept doing the work uh, in obscurity it was in an insignificant place he was thrashing grain in a wine press nobody did that however that's what Gideon was committed to and that's the very place uh, that God sent an angel. If I had time, I would push this a little further because I want to suggest that for many of us, there are moments that you are like Gideon. There you are. You got gift, but you're scared to show it. You, you have something on the inside of you, uh, but you're afraid that if people ever got a glimpse uh, of all the things that you can accomplish, they'll start taking from you. So uh, you do what Gideon did. Gideon said, I'm still committed to the work. I just don't want nobody knowing what I'm doing. I don't want nobody to know my name. You are committing to thrashing grain uh, in a while. Wine press. And here's the good news, my brothers and sisters, and this is what I need to alert you to, because I know you're trying to be incognito. I know you don't want people to know what you got going on. I know you're try trying to have your name called. I know you're just sitting in the audience uh, and sitting on your gifts, and you don't think that nobody knows uh, your talents and your giftings. However, let me tell you something. Let me give you a little secret. You think you're hiding from people, and you just might. Uh, however, you can never hide uh, what you have been gifted with from God, because uh, 
God will meet you right where you are. I ought to have somebody here under the sound of my voice that you thought you could hide in the wine press. You thought that nobody would know your name. However, you seen God show up in some obscure and insignificant places. Can I tell you, just when you think you're hiding is when God finds you. Just when you assume that nobody knows the hard work you're putting in, God will find you right where you are. Do I got anybody under the sound of my voice that's just been going about your business? You've been trying to do it and keep it to yourself, but can I tell you, when you give your work, God will just show up out of nowhere, and he'll find you in your seasons of obscurity. Because here's the thing I've learned. And even when people don't know your name, God knows where you are. Even when people don't see your commitment, God sees your commitment. Even when you're unsure of yourself and all you're doing is thrashing grain at wine presses at night, God will still show up. I'm here to tell you. This, this NBA playoffs has been intriguing to me. Haven't been able to watch most of it, but I will tell you, I think that the play-in and the first round, second round, third round will probably be a whole lot more entertaining than the finals. I know you're holding out hope, but let me be clear. The Denver Nuggets are going to win the NBA championship. It's no knock on Jimmy Butler in the Miami Heat. The Denver Nuggets are just a phenomenal team. But if you're a Miami Heat fan, you should still be cool. Why? Because your team was, was placed eighth going into the playoffs, has made it this far. And I will tell you that Eastern Conference Finals between Miami Heat and Boston Celtics was a drag down epic event. And I know Miami Heat came out on top. We can argue if you want to argue the Boston Celtics lost versus the Miami Heat won. That's your own. However, I will admit to you, there was some controversy in my opinion. Because the Eastern Conference Finals MVP was given to Jimmy Butler. But I can make the argument that there was another player on the Miami Heat that was probably more valuable that should have got it. I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but he's part of the light-skinned delegation. His name is Caleb Martin. He's a card-carrying member of the light-skinned delegation. Man, if you watch the Eastern Conference Finals, Caleb Martin was balling out of control, hitting threes, creating shots. I mean, I can make the argument when Jimmy Butler was having tough games between game three, four, and five, and six, it was Caleb Martin that was keeping the Miami Heat in. You could make an argument. He deserved that MVP trophy. But what most people don't realize is that Caleb Martin, most of us, let's be honest, before even this conference, even this year, had never heard of Caleb Martin. There's a reason for that. Because Caleb Martin really was an undrafted player into the NBA. Played a couple years for the Charlotte Hornets on a restricted contract and was waived in 2021. And so you're asking the critical question, how did this important piece of the Miami Heat make it to the team after being waived by another team? Well, one of the things you must understand is the story of Caleb Martin is pretty powerful. What had happened was he got his shot again because of a relationship that was forged in 2014. He used to go up to NC State to play pickleball, and it just so happened that at NC State playing pickleball with him was a man, a rapper by the name of J. Cole. J. Cole met Caleb Martin in 2014. So when the season began for the Miami Heat this past year, it was J. Cole who met Caleb Martin in 2014 when nobody knew Caleb Martin's name, when nobody thought that he had much game to offer when, before he was an undrafted player into the NBA. It was J. Cole who called his friend Karan Butler, who was on the coaching staff of the Miami. He said, look, man, you need to give this guy a shot. And so because of a moment that was done in obscurity in a time when nobody was jocking Caleb Martin, he got his shot because of a relationship was made. And that same Caleb Martin is the same one that got his shot. And when his name got called, he stepped up. I wish I had time to help you because I want you to know just when you don't think people is watching, God is watching. Just when you don't think your hard work is paying off, God will show up. Somebody can testify. God will raise you in seasons of obscurity. He calls them. Seasons of obscurity. That's the first thing of this passage. But then there's another layer into this because I also want to offer that God calls us, watch this, even with thoughts of uncertainty. Here is what's interesting. When the angel, the emissary of God, shows up, sees Gideon thrashing wheat in a wine press, he acknowledges, watch this, this is his first introduction, and notices how he references Gideon. He says, what's up? Mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. This confuses Gideon 
Gideon at the time, first of all, goes on this diatribe. We're trying to figure out, first of all, um, I need to understand if you're from God, if you're with God, where's all these miracles God had proclaimed? I'm trying to figure out if God is so good, how come we're going through the stuff that we're going through? And with that, the angel still stays steadfast, still affirms him, says you are a mighty man of valor. God is with you. God is going to send you with the strength you have to handle the Midianites. That's when Gideon acknowledges, hold on. How can that be? I'm the weakest of my clan in the most non-prominent tribe of Manasseh. What do you mean God is going to send me? That's when the angel continues to suggest you are a mighty man of valor. God keeps calling Gideon a mighty man of valor. And all Gideon keeps reminding God is he's the weakest. He's of the most non-prominent tribe. How can you call me that I am the one when I am weak, I am small, I am of no stature? And yet the angel stays resolute. You are a mighty man of valor. Matter of fact, if I had better rendering of this, I think the Hebrew tells this more because it's a repetitive term. He doesn't just say mighty man of valor, but he does it in two terms. Mighty man of valor, mighty man of valor. He doubles up. It gives more emphasis. Here, God is saying you are this mighty man of valor. But all Gideon wants to remind God is I'm weak. I'm from the smallest clan. And the reason I had to slow down in this point, because I would offer that perhaps most of our biggest issue, most of our biggest struggle ain't with the enemy. Oftentimes, our biggest hindrance to stepping into God, who God wants us to be, is the fact that you can't get beyond how you see you. And you always want to remind God, now God, you don't know me like I know me. I'm weak. I am insignificant. I I got some problems. And all the while, God keeps saying, I'm not calling you based on how you see you. I'm calling you based on how I see you. And I don't know who I'm talking to. And I wonder if there's somebody here that every now and again, that's your biggest struggle. That's the biggest battle in your mind is that God keeps telling you you're amazing. But you keep saying, but God, I done messed up. God keeps telling you you're a mighty person of value. But you want to keep telling God your resume. God, I did this. God, I flunked out here. God, I have this on my resume. Can I tell you, child of God, uh, you bringing up your resume, your ratchetness, all that good stuff uh, ain't surprising God, but maybe God in this season uh, is trying to help you understand uh, that I'm not calling you based on how you see you. Uh, I need you to learn how to mature uh, to see yourself like I see you. I know that's not going to be easy for many of us to embrace uh, because we have such a defeated mentality. Uh, We allow what we perceive ourselves to be uh, to be the thing that holds us back. Uh, But sometimes that's why it gets dangerous uh, reading the Word of God. uh, Because reading the Word of God will start you thinking uh, how God sees you. That's why, child of God, uh, you keep trying to tell God uh, what you can't do. And God trying to tell you what you can do. You keep trying to tell God, I'm divorced, but God says, I can still use you. You keep telling God, I done did this, and God says, I can still use you. Keep trying to tell God, I got laid off. I ain't got no money, but God says, uh, I can provide for you. Sometimes you got to learn how to take God's Word uh, over your own mentality. You got to start saying, God, uh, if you said I'm the head and not the tail, I'm going to believe it. Uh, If you said I'm the lender and not the borrower, I'm going to believe it. Uh, If you said I'm blessed going in uh, and I'm blessed going out, uh, I just going to make up my mind. Uh, I looked at my portfolio. Uh, I done checked out my bank account. Uh, I done read my own resume. Uh, I done read the tabloids about me. But God, if you said it, uh, I'm going to trust what you said uh, over my own word about myself. I wish I had some people. uh, Every now and again, you ought to touch yourself. uh, and say, self, listen to God. Stop trying to take your own self down. God didn't just show up to keep you where you are. Sometimes he has to speak those things in our life so he can affirm in us what he believes us to be. I want someone to hear me. Because perhaps that's what's incarcerating many of us today. Perhaps that's the very thing that's causing you to stay stagnant. Is you can't stop thinking about you like you think about you. But I'm here to tell you that every now and again, you got to learn to see yourself like God sees yourself. You got to hurt, be able to see yourself how God has fashioned you. I'm talking to some people in here. 
that you're sitting under the sound of my voice, you're probably tuned in, and I'm not sure if it's in online or on demand, but I'm here to tell you, stop defeating yourself. Stop telling yourself what you can't do. Stop trying to say, uh, because you grew up here, uh, and because this happened to you, uh, and because this allowed uh, in your life. Can I tell you, God's words uh, are able to shift things around. That's why I tell people, uh, you got to learn how to wake up every morning uh, and declare some things uh, over your life. I know you don't think it's big, uh, but Scripture reminds us there's life and death in the power of the tongue, uh, which means when I wake up, I tell myself, I'm going to have a good day. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to tell myself, today, uh, we going to be victorious because uh, God is a victorious God. Uh, I dare you, do me a favor if you're in person, uh, elbow somebody beside you uh, and say, what is God saying about you? Uh, stop trying to listen to yourself uh, and learn how to listen to God. I, I love it. I, um, I, I, I really get energized with some of the amazing fathers we have here at our church. Some amazing men of God who really exemplify in me amazing fatherhood. I'm talking recently to Dante Stewart, I for the last few weeks, he's been having to take care of his two younger children while his wife is, is away. And so it's interesting how he called me one morning and he says, you know, PG, I, I always have to remind my son who he is. He said, I always have to, we wake up in the morning and part of our exercise together is we have daily moments of affirmation. So I make him repeat to me, I am smart. I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to do this. Now, there's some days, PG. He don't have such a good day. But we still wake up that next morning and we still make those same declarations and affirmations. Or, I am smart. I am good. I'm going to do well today. And he says, uh, it's something about starting this as moments to push him and prod him. And that thing started me thinking because I wonder how many of us would have such a different trajectory of our day. A different outlook of our life. Instead of you always defeating yourself and reminding you of what you can't do, what if you woke up every day said, I'm the kid of the king. I am victorious. I am healed. I am delivered. I am strong. I wish I had somebody in here that can testify every now and again. You got to learn to affirm yourself based on what God said you are. You're thoughts of uncertainty. It reminds me of the inaugural call of Jesus. If you remember that in Mark chapter 1, it's interesting that after he was baptized, came out of the water, here is what you hear from the Lord. He says, uh, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. If I could unpack that a little bit, that thing blessed me because at this moment in Mark chapter 1, when God says that he's pleased with Jesus, this is early in the ministry of Jesus. He ain't done nothing but be baptized. He ain't opened up no blinded eyes. He ain't fed no multitudes with two fish and five loaves. But still, God was giving him affirmation as if to remind him, I don't care what else is going to happen. I need you to be clear about who you are. I need you to know that I'm pleased with you. I need you to know that you are my son. Every now and again, I need someone to hear me that when we mess up, we didn't surprise God. Uh, when we faltered, we didn't surprise God. Uh, he still thinks good thoughts towards us. He still uh, has a future and a hope for us. He still uh, has an expected end. Look at somebody and tell him, uh, he'll even call you with thoughts of uncertainty. I'm weak, but God says I'm a mighty man of valor. He calls us in seasons of obscurity. He calls us with thoughts of uncertainty, but then here it is, the last one, and I'll let you go. He calls us with beliefs of singularity because part of what's couched in verse 15 and his acknowledgement of being weak, his acknowledgement of not being strong, his acknowledgement of not coming from the more prominent tribe, is that what he failed to understand is that he was approaching this moment as if God was sending him by himself. Part of his issue and disdainment of the moment is that he could not conceptualize in his mind that God, look, you know me. I'm weak, I don't have the authority, I don't have the status. No one going to know me. How can I fight the Midianites? And that's when he learns that this call was not a call of singularity. It was a call of partnership. Amen. That God knew the resume of Gideon. And I would raise to you was one of the things that was attractive about Gideon. Because when Gideon gets through doing what God needs him to do. People could not give Gideon all the props because they knew Gideon could not do it by himself. So I would offer that God strategically chose someone the world would perceive weak, 
The world will perceive him with no status because he understood that when I put you where I know you can go and you accomplish what I need you to accomplish, he then says that they won't just give glory to you. They'll know if it had not been for the Lord on your side. Where would you be? I'm done. That's what verse 16, if I was to give it to you, hopefully y'all join with us all summer. I'm looking forward to preaching the narrative of Gideon. But notice how God responds to Gideon. He gives him a promise. He said, the Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. I'm done. Here it is. This is the whole thing. He says, I'm not just sending you by yourself, but I'm going to give you a promise. And it's a two-pronged promise. Here it is. The first part of this promise is I'm going to be with you. I I want you to know, Gideon, uh, that you ain't going on a solo mission. I need you to know, Gideon, uh, that I'm not sending you out by yourself. I need you to know, Gideon, uh, that I am making a pledge to you now uh, that wherever you go, I'm with you. Whatever you do, uh, I'm with you. Wherever you got to fight, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you uh, to uh, yourself. And I know there's someone here under the sound of my voice. uh, That's the only thing that's kept you sane uh, in an insane world. That's the only thing uh, that has allowed you to have some confidence in the midst of your weaknesses that you understand you got a God that does not leave you to your aloneness but you got a God that walks with you and talks with you. You got a God that's hand in hand and step in step. I believe I got a few people that can testify. If I was to talk to you to Mike today, you could say the Lord has been with me. When I look back over my life, the Lord has been with me. When I see what I've been able to do, the Lord has been with me. When I've been able to walk the walk and talk the talk, the Lord has been with me. Can somebody testify? That's the thing I give God praise for is that on the one hand, He never leaves me by myself. On the one hand, he makes sure he's there with me. On the one hand, he lets me know that there's no place I can go that God won't be with me. That's the first part of the promise is that he's basically telling him, I'll be with you. But then the second part of the promise is he says, basically, I need you to know that when me and you team up, I'm sending you to an enemy that has caused you problems the last seven years. But let me tell you, Gideon, don't you stress, don't you get frustrated, don't you get mad. Don't you cuss nobody out. I'm going to tell you uh, that by the time you get to fight them, uh, the very ones that have been raiding y'all for seven years, the very ones you've been hiding from, uh, he said that by the time you get in the battle, uh, it's going to be like you fighting against one man. Uh, In other words, he says, this is the promise. Uh, Not only am I going to be with you, uh, but I'm going to give you an easy victory. Uh, I need you to know before you even lace up your boots uh, and pull up your sword, uh, I need you to know this victory uh, has all already been won. I wish I had time to help someone in here, but if you don't get nothing else from this summer series, what if I told you the very thing you're afraid to face is the very thing God wants to give you victory over, and all you got to learn how to do is take God at God's word, because God will make what's hard for you now be the very thing he puts under your feet. I got to get out of here. May the Lord bless you real good, but I was listening to my big brother in the faith not too long ago. Uh, a man by the name of Howard John Wesley. Uh, We've been friends for close to 20 years. uh, And he gives the story where he was teaching his congregation uh, another name for God. Uh, He was telling them that I know many of you uh, call him Jehovah Jireh. Many of you call him uh, Elohim. Many of you call him uh, this or that. But he said, let me teach you uh, another name for God. Uh, He gives them the story uh, of how he was meeting with one of their members, uh, a younger man who was having a lot of problems. Uh, He said his wife had been sick. Uh, His child was acting up. He wasn't sure his job was going to be stable enough for them to keep food on the table. And he said, Pastor, will you please pray that we will be able to stand and thrive in moments like this? Howard John Wesley said, I told the young brother, I'm going to pray for you. Well, a few weeks went by, and he ran again against that young man. And the young man provided him an update. He said, well, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. My wife is still sickly, and sometimes my child just be acting crazy, and I'm now in between good jobs. Uh, However, he said, somehow, uh, the bills continue to get paid. Uh, Somehow, uh, food's still on the table. Uh, Somehow, my child uh, ain't got kicked out of school. Uh, And that's when Howard John Wesley see, uh, some of y'all can't say amen because you miss God's name uh, in his testimony. Uh, Because you waiting on me to say Elijah or Jehovah Jireh. But you missed it because the name of God uh, in the man's testimony uh, was somehow. uh, 
it was somehow that kept putting food on his table. Uh, somehow that kept his bills paid. Uh, somehow that kept his kid out of trouble. Uh, and that's all I came to tell you. Uh, I don't know how God is going to do it. Uh, I don't know when God is going to do it. Uh, all I know is somehow uh, he going to make a way. Uh, I got to get out of here. Uh, but grab someone by the hand. Uh, shake that neighbor's hand. Uh, and say somehow. Uh, somehow God's going to open the door. Uh, somehow God's going to heal the body. Uh, Somehow God's going to do what only God can do. It's an easy victory when you trust in the somehow of God. Do I got anybody here that wants to open your mouth and shout somehow? Everyone standing. Everyone standing. Somehow, somehow, somehow. You got what it takes he'll find you in the wine press you got what it takes he'll find you with thoughts that never think that you're gonna make it or that you're too weak you ain't healed you got what it takes and he lets you know I'm with you and it's gonna be an easy victory to our tab global family our prayer is that you will join with us all summer. I think the story of Gideon is going to really challenge us to learn how to trust God at a higher level. But I also believe that Gideon offers to us one of the most unique things about how the areas we perceive God to be absent might just be the place God is sending us to be the answer. I get people all the time, Pastor, what's my ministry? And I tell people, you know your ministry. And here's how I know, because all of us have moments of frustration, things that we can't really reconcile. Those places of frustration is really your ministry. Because it is those moments of frustration that produces purpose. You are the answer to what you are frustrated about. To our Tab Global family, I believe that, and I hope and pray that we'll take this season a time of discernment, thinking because I want you to know God sees you right where you are God we pray for our tab global family it is our desire God that you would walk with them and help them and guide them thank you for their partnership with us and how you still allow us to be able to touch so many whether in person or online that you've allowed those of our brothers and sisters who connect with us, whether it's now, a few weeks, or even years from now, just because the word has a way of transcending time to meet us in our point of need. So, Lord, bless our Tab Global family. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. To our Tab Global family, God bless you. You see the multiple ways that you can connect. The heart of this church is always open and available to you. We pray that you have a prosperous and amazing day and summer. And we want you to know the best is still yet to come. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Take care.